Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Jean-Louis Debrauer, and I'm the director of the European Affairs Program of the Egmont Institute. We are very glad to welcome you in this uh, premises. Uh, a few words uh, by way of introduction to this uh, first panel, which are inspired both by a conversation I had with uh, Philippe when we were preparing the program of this conference, and the living memory I had of a very uh, robust discussion that we had in the early days of the Odysseus Network with someone many of you might remember, Henri Labelle, about whether there was anything like an EU migration policy or not. And Henri was fiercely opposed to the idea of the concept of a EU migration policy because at the time he was saying, but there is nothing, no, no instruments are in place. I mean, uh, there is no budget, there is no administration, so why the hell are you talking about an EU immigration policy? Of course, there has been uh, many water under many bridges since then, and all these instruments are more or less in place nowadays, but the purpose of this panel is to check and to discuss together whether it is enough to cater for the challenges of managing migration. Uh, let me say a few words uh, in, by way of introduction and maybe also uh, to raise some provocative questions, and I hope that our speakers and friends will follow up on this provocative tone. Uh, agencies will come first. Uh, I'm definitely not amongst those who are jumping up and down, shouting Frontex, Frontex, Frontex each time that there is a migration issue on the horizon. I'm quoting Charles de Gaulle there. Uh, similarly, as far as the heirs of fate is concerned, uh, I am a little bit those who are seeing the bottle as half full, half, half empty. It was important that an agreement was reached on EASO uh, at the end of the Portuguese presidency, simply just, I mean, to get out, get, get out a little bit, uh, get, out, get rid of this feeling of despair. I mean, this pact is leading nowhere. So reaching an agreement on EASO was restoring a kind of a yes we can uh, feeling. But at the same time, it's very obvious that the provisions that were left aside or at least frozen to allow this agreement to take place are very indicative or where the main problem is for the time being. And I might come back on that tomorrow during our concluding uh, session, that you say, at member states level. Uh, turning to the budget. Uh, Maybe the, what the issue, at, what, what is at stake is not that much the, the, the amount of money available. It's, it is how it is spent. I must say the kind of take the money and run approach, uh, which has been inspired by, to the member states by the implementation of the structural funds, is slowly but surely getting on my nerves, as a plain European taxpayer, I have to say. We have now a blueprint that could be a model that could be duplicated in other, uh, re re implementing other instruments, and that the blueprint of the implementation of the next generation EU package, uh, the resilience uh, and recovery uh, strategy. We've been working on that a lot within Egmont, and I have my friend and colleague uh, Francois Roux uh, in front of me. I know that it is a different budgetary technique which is applicable on that, but I think that in terms of monitoring and steering the, mon the way the money is spent, we have there a source of inspiration. What does that mean? That means that national plans have to be approved by the Commission, that there is a peer review process before the national plans are actually implemented by the Commission, that these national plans include benchmark and targets, and that the money is released if and only if these benchmarks and targets are uh, reached maybe a source of inspiration. Of course, we should, could have added to this uh, panel a reference because it was quote, I mean, referred to time and again during the introductory session to the role of the court and of the jurisprudence. But okay, that will be kind of a fil rouge, a red line, a, 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 a thread, thread all over uh, our session, and we're going to come time and again, amongst other things tomorrow, amongst other, uh, other things tomorrow morning, about the crucial and the growing role of the uh, judicial institutions, either uh, in Strasbourg or in uh, Luxembourg. Now, a word about the institutional framework and the decision-making process. We dwelled a lot uh, during the first session about the decision-making process within the Council. But mind you guys, this is co-decision. And there is another uh, institution which is involved, and that's the European Parliament. 
uh, we haven't said a word about the role of the European Parliament and the possible position of the European Parliament. Of course, we have all read time and again this fantastic impact assessment that was released over the summer and that was already blatantly disregarded by a few parliamentarians simply because it was not sounding the kind of music that they would have liked to hear. But it's there. It cannot be ignored. And by the way, it has already been backed for what it's worth by the Council of the Economic and Social Committee and by the, the, the Council of the Regions. So that will have to be factored into uh, the way the European Parliament will set up its position. And of course, uh, I have no precise indication about their timing, but it will take time for the European Parliament to get its act together on this very complicated text. So the question is not that much whether the Council will decide by qualified majority or by unanimity, but the question is also pretty much about the time that it will take for the two co-legislators to actually engage in a view of possibly reaching an agreement on these texts which are We've heard that time and again this morning, quite controversial. So where does that lead us into, into, in terms of timing of the decision-making process? We are going to enter a French presidency, which is going to be what it is, with a presidential election at midterm, so most probably not very much able to deliver a lot. But anyway, I mean, I would be surprised, you can contradict me for those of you who are better connected with the decision-making process, if everything was right for entering into the possible meaningful stage of negotiation between, at the earliest, the second semester of next year. There, we have a Czech presidency. Uh, it happens that I was involved recently in a workshop about the uh, possible achievement of the incoming Czech presidency, and all participants to the workshop, even in the case of a change of majority in Prague at the next uh, uh, general election in that country, were of the view, were sharing the same opinion. As far as the migration pact is concerned, the issue will be sorted out either before or after the Czech presidency, but not during the Czech presidency. So that leads us to the next year, where we have Sweden and Spain. So if there are Swedes and Spanish colleagues in the room, mind you, it might be your moment. And if it's not your moment, it will be the Belgian presidency's moment, first semester of 2024. And what does that mean, ladies and gentlemen, that we might be in the room where sometime during the first semester of 2024, you're going to have a major ministerial conference trying to put the final dot to the negotiation of the migration uh, pact, if it is someone remember in the room by that time that there was at the time a migration uh, pact. Now, of course, a possible alternative would be to come back to the good old crisis management. And then I turn to the third uh, item of our agenda today. Uh, our colleagues and friends of the European Policy Centre, who are very cr creative and imaginative, have invented a new concept in the Brussels bubble, which is the perma crisis, the permanent crisis. There's nothing to do with permafrost, it is the permanent crisis. That is the idea that, after all, it's only in time of crisis that the EU might be indeed able to decide, to reach breakthrough. Why not? Uh, we have to think a little bit about, I mean, the role, the, the, the role play here. Uh, I might be a little bit provocative, and I'm sorry that Neil is not with us anymore. Uh, having heard Neil this morning, and anyway, having read a lot of things, I have the feeling that clearly the ball is not in the court of the Commission anymore. It has gone. It's out of its end. Uh, the rotating presidency has its sweetnesses. Uh, I just tried to illustrate them, that in a way a bit ironically, but okay, we have to understand that these are quite technical and difficult texts. That means that each incoming presidency has to prepare its officials to deal with something which is very technical and for many of them not so familiar. So from that point of view, you might argue that maybe the rotating presidency is not helpful in delivering a swift uh, decision-making uh, uh, process. So indeed, crisis mean up to the European Council. Anyway, let me be absolutely clear that, about, about that. Whether they want to discuss this about consensus or not, at the end of the day, the migration pact will be a chef's act. There will be no outcome of this discussion before the European Council which put it, before we, it, it put its teeth tease deep into the subject matter. And of course, crisis management at European Council means leadership, means leadership. So the question is, who is going to be the next Merkel? Uh, I leave it to you. 
But that means also that if we enter into the crisis management mode to find the solution uh, to the many dilemma around the, uh, you, the migration pact, then you might, we might have to remember the title of the good old song of the Rolling Stones, you can't always get what you want. Uh, now, last but not least, Afghanistan, which indeed, indeed, and I'm very uh, happy that uh, Philip uh, took, uh, was courageous enough uh, to take that on board on the agenda of that last session. Uh, indeed, Afghanistan could have provided the wonderful opportunity, never miss a good crisis, of another crisis that could have provided this kind of breakthrough. Not. And we heard that this morning, I could, not, uh, uh, I could not approve that more. I mean, the signal sent by the Council, adopted, the conclusion adopted by the Council, is that the EU do not want this to become an internal crisis. Uh, I really recommend everybody to read time and again these conclusions adopted by the Council. At the same time as the fantastic editorial that Catherine Woolard wrote in the Ecre Bulletin about this. Uh, uh, th this, uh, this set of conclusions. I mean, uh, uh, I, I, Catherine, we don't have the time. I know that you're still in the room, but I would so much like to quote many of the sentences of your editor, starting by the first one. During the week of the rentrée, the Justice and Home Affairs Council demonstrated that it is still possible to produce something shocking in the field of asylum and migration. Yes, maybe. But this is a landmark document in terms of crisis management at EU level. It is the first time that the Council sets on paper what is an integrated crisis management model is and will be in the future. Please read the final paragraph of that document. That I will do it, and then I will pass the floor uh, to uh, Lilian. So, Lilian, you better get uh, prepared to take over on the agencies. It reads. The Council will follow, closely, will follow closely the development in the area of international protection, migration, and security. It will respond to attempts to instrumentalize illegal migration for political purposes and other hybrid threats, including by developing new tools. The Council will also monitor closely the implementation of the actions mentioned above and ensure regular stock taking in order to further improve the EU's crisis management capacity, building upon the tools already developed, coordination of all dimensions of this situation, humanitarian development, international protection, migration, security, foreign policy is crucial. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the blueprint for crisis management by the, Commission, by the EU in the future. Now, I hope that I've been provocative enough. Lilian, can you follow up on agencies? The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jean-Louis, for this uh, excellent introduction. And I also have uh, a PowerPoint that uh, I hope, yes, will uh, start being projected. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lilian Zurdi. I am an assistant professor at Maastricht University, where I am also implementing a Dutch Research Council uh, grant, which uh, actually deals with the pieces that our colleague Amri Labelle thought uh, that were missing. So the administrative governance of the asylum policy, including uh, EU agencies. And uh, here today, I will uh, try to address the question, are we and should we move towards a, an integrated uh, European administration uh, through agencies? So as you saw also in your program, in these uh, initial questions that we, that we had, well, what conceptually and legally, what is at stake here is a move, in fact, from the so-called executive uh, federalism. So when we have more uh, EU in implementation in the form of EU agencies uh, jointly uh, implementing and, and being in, uh, involved, what we have is a passage from this model of executive federalism to a more integrated, if you want, administration. So the EU level actually uh, being active in the phase uh, of implementation. And is the, the, the solution, so more EU through EU agencies as the solution, I will focus on, on three areas I already mentioned, and this is the most known, the operational uh, involvement, which at times has uh, reached the level of uh, joint implementation. 
then I will refer to monitoring functions and I will come back also to the comments that uh, Jean-Louis made about uh, the new uh, regulation of the asylum agency. And uh, I will also comment on uh, emerging steering functions uh, of these agencies. And I will uh, contrast uh, in my uh, observations uh, what has been happening, developments, legal and uh, de facto uh, developments in uh, focusing on uh, Frontex and the EU Asylum Agency. I draw uh, actually from the text of the agreement in uh, June uh, 2021, uh, which is uh, available as usual uh, through State Watch. So I am referring uh, to uh, the Council uh, document which portrays uh, the agreement. So if we contrast the operational, uh, the involvement in operations between uh, the two agencies, we will see, of course, that this is more uh, robust uh, in the case of uh, Frontex. The regulation even reaches uh, the point of mentioning that integrated border management is a shared responsibility of the agency and the national uh, authorities. We have no uh, such declarations uh, for uh, the area of asylum, even in the newest uh, version of the document. We also see, and this has been uh, mentioned uh, already, uh, quite a high level of ambition also in what concerns uh, staffing with this uh, 10,000 by 2027, which will include both own agency staff, so uh, statutory staff and also member state staff uh, that should be ready uh, for uh, deployment. We have, uh, as you see, a more modest ambition in EASO. We have this asylum reserve pools uh, of 500 persons. And also there is talk about, of course, expansion of the own staff of, of the agency, but nothing uh, close uh, compared to the ambition uh, of Frontex. So Frontex standing uh, core, uh, which is all uh, the, the above, uh, have uh, explicit uh, executive uh, powers which are quite far reaching, for example, uh, in the area of return almost in, in every uh, aspect with the only exception of entering into the merits uh, of uh, return uh, decisions. Things uh, are more uh, murky and they will remain uh, more murky uh, in what concerns uh, the asylum uh, agency. So the URE. So the URE this remains heavily uh, circumscribed. I will come back uh, in the end to uh, discuss, to debate if this is something positive or, or uh, negative. So there have been different iterations uh, of uh, the text in the negotiations, but we ended up uh, with something quite uh, circumscribed, so facilitating the examination of, of applications or providing member states with necessary assistance. This does not portray fully what actually has been happening uh, on the ground uh, in Greece, uh, where we had uh, agency deployees actually independently conducting part uh, of the processing, so either the admissibility procedure or uh, the merits, whereas, of course, uh, it was up to the Greek asylum service to adopt the final decisions. Of course, they didn't have decision-making uh, power, but they were quite influential and they were independently conducting part of the processing. This uh, has documented, for example, I have uh, documented uh, also in, in different articles. This is not uh, reflected uh, in even the newest uh, version of uh, the regulation. So moving ahead in uh, monitoring. There too uh, we see that uh, Frontex is, is more uh, advanced. Uh, we have already this so-called vulnerability assessment which is uh, operational and uh, the aim is to assess the capacities of member states and, and consequences of the capacities or lack thereof on the functioning of the Schengen area and there is a certain gradation of measures 
depending also on the collaboration of the member state and, and of the impact uh, of actions uh, on uh, the ground, but which can lead ultimately uh, to a council implementing act uh, mandating deployments. So what has happened uh, in this uh, agreement of the asylum agency, which we already heard about also in the introductory uh, session, that it was one of the breakthroughs, let's say, in the negotiations uh, of the pact so far? Well, the breakthrough had to do with the fact that the monitoring mechanism remains frozen or partially uh, frozen. So it is completely uh, frozen, the kind of monitoring mechanism that is included uh, in EASO until uh, the end of uh, 2023. Uh, and thereafter, it will begin uh, to be uh, operational, but not its enforcement parts, uh, not this gradation uh, of measures. So that will not become operational until uh, the moment where we will have also the successor to uh, the Dublin regulation. So there has been a bit of quid pro quo there uh, in the negotiations, and we see that this is quite a sensitive uh, also issue uh, for the member states. So they do see these monitoring functions as being uh, quite far reaching, and they wouldn't fully have them uh, if, if you want before, uh, and until there was a solution also uh, on uh, responsibility sharing and the new solidarity mechanisms. So less known are the so-called, what I call functions with a, a steering uh, potential. So in, in Frontex, we have this so-called multi-annual strategic policy cycle for integrated border management, a kind of collaboration and, and multi-annual planning between the agency and, and the commission. On this basis, the agency adopts a technical and operational uh, strategy, and then member states are to establish their own uh, strategies in respect of both uh, these uh, documents. So this is a kind of steering function where, though, we see the collaboration between uh, at policy level uh, of the agency close hand in hand uh, with the commission. In terms of the new asylum uh, agency, this will take place uh, with the so-called common analysis and guidance notes. I am referring to enhanced uh, COI. Philip will also uh, perhaps speak upon this in his presentation. So this is supposed to assist the member states in the examination uh, of claims. They will be quite influential. They will be endorsed uh, by the management board and member states are to take them into account. However, without a prejudice to their competence for deciding on individual applications. So they will not be, uh, if you will, uh, legally binding. So this is what has happened in the instruments of the agencies themselves. Now, what has been happening, though, in terms of the rest of the pact instruments? So we have a lot of declarations in the communication of the Commission on the role of the agencies and, and their importance. Uh, but as I argued also in the blog uh, of uh, in the series uh, directed by uh, Daniel, uh, the pact instruments do not satisfactorily embed these uh, new, newer functions and this enhanced role of, of EU agencies. Some examples are from the screening, which has been uh, largely actually developed uh, in to mirror uh, the hotspot approach to migration management and what has been happening uh, at hotspots. So here we have weak uh, formulations where member states may be assisted or, or supported. In uh, the, the border uh, procedure, we see EASO can support uh, member states, but there is nothing, this is in the explanatory memorandum, there is nothing within uh, the text that fully reflects, well, the procedural uh, implications and uh, the accountability deficit of agency involvement in these procedures. So all the learning uh, that we had in Greece where we had this active involvement uh, of the agency has not been uh, taken up and uh, reflected. 
And the other uh, point is that uh, the pact has this kind of ambivalent approach uh, towards further uh, administrative integration, which is portrayed, uh, for example, uh, in the return sponsorships. And we will hear uh, more about return sponsorships in, in another uh, panel. I'm just noting that these activities are supposed to be additional uh, to the ones uh, carried uh, by Frontex. So we have a kind of two-track uh, involvement. We have the EU uh, level uh, through uh, Frontex, and we have also a kind of transnational cooperation, which is proposed as a kind of new solidarity uh, measure. Uh, which, apart from the fundamental rights considerations, raises also issues such as uh, the practicality, uh, the economies of scale, duplication of actions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it is clear that the Commission uh, decided uh, to go down uh, that path. So to come back uh, to the question uh, that was set uh, at the beginning, do we and should we have uh, more EU through EU agencies as the solution? Well, there are uh, some uh, red uh, flags, and we will have a panel that will more focus on uh, fundamental rights, uh, where uh, it will be important to reflect also on the role of the EU agencies. Do we have a, an accountability deficit or, or overload? How can both be true? So we have a multitude of accountability uh, processes uh, that relate to these agencies. But the issue is, are they really effective? Are they uh, coming, uh, let's say, to the point? This is something that we can pick up uh, in, in the discussion. And with this new uh, monitoring function, some existing, some uh, emergence, we have to be mindful of this tension. So agencies will be called to jointly implement, and then they are actually, in another hat, uh, be called uh, actually to monitoring what is going on, including uh, their own uh, involvement. So there, are, uh, there is certainly some underlying uh, tension there. There is this ambivalence in further uh, operational involvement. It seems that member states like it in, in practice, but they still remain reluctant to portray this operational uh, role uh, in law, especially in what concerns uh, the, the asylum agency, where their current role is not fully reflected in the pact. And, and the, the normative question, should we aim for more administrative integration? What I always say is that administrative integration is a tool. It is neither inherently positive, neither inherently negative. The fact is that we have to be mindful on how uh, we design it and how we operationalize it. So because of perhaps poor or ad hoc uh, design and operationalization so far, there have been some negative sentiments. We heard also, uh, which, which have a, a basis, we heard also Catherine Woolard saying, oh, EASO, this is good because its powers were restricted. It will not be as operational. So such were uh, the defaults in this first uh, phasing out that we have come to the conclusion that perhaps administrative integration in itself uh, is an ill. I would say that we have to keep uh, more of an open uh, mind uh, in this tool, but certainly we would have to design accordingly to, to take in mind fundamental rights, considerations, uh, accountability, et cetera, et cetera, which is something that has not happened uh, to date, and we do not see uh, clear signs of, of it uh, happening so far. So I stop my observations here and I look forward to your questions uh, later. Uh, thank you very much, Lillian. I think that your presentation is exactly in line with what we would expect from this conference, that is to say to uh, ask questions very clearly in a very lucid way and at the same time maybe open paths for uh, what the next steps could be. Uh, may I now turn to uh, Iris uh, to tell us more about whether a more EU fund or better spend EU fund could contribute to the full implementation of the objectives and aims of the pact. Thank you, Iris, for your contribution. Uh, 
thank you very much. So I would first like to thank uh, Jean-Louis for an excellent introduction and also Philip for the invitation and for investing his really brilliant mind and his heart into the organization of this conference and in the whole Odysseus network. So thank you both. So uh, my intention for the next 10 minutes is to address the financial aspects of the Migration Pact and the challenges these financial aspects may pose for the successful negotiation, adoption, and implementation of the pact. And by doing so, I will try to show that uh, the ongoing process of increasing EU funding for migration and asylum, even though it is only complementary to national expenditures, is a move in the right direction, uh, and that it should be continued in the future. And in my talk, I would like to address three issues. First, um, in order to explain the financial background of the Migration Pact, I will discuss the status of asylum, migration, and border control budget in the new multiannual financial framework in comparison to the previous budgetary period. Second, I will discuss the consistency between the new asylum and migration budget and the Migration Pact. And finally, I will address the impacts financial issues can have on successful adoption and implementation of the pact. So I'm now moving to the first part of my talk, the status of asylum, migration, border control budget in the new MFF. So as we all know, in previous years, asylum, migration, and border control budget had a relatively small percentage of the overall EU budget. Uh, and it has grown rather slowly uh, over the budgetary periods. For example, it amounted to only 1.4% of the EU budget in 2016, so six years ago. And this is due, partly due to the intergovernmental nature of the asylum and migration policies up to the Treaty of Amsterdam, and partly to the sensitivity of the subject matter. Uh, a more ambitious asylum and migration budget has been agreed only with the new MFF, um, and it was prompted by the experience of insufficient funding during the 2015-2016 refugee influx, and this led to the reshuffling of the funds and significant increase of contingency margins and flexibility instruments. And uh, so this is one of the important factors that had Im impacted the increase of the current budget. However, here I would like to make three points. First, the emphasis of the new MFF, as has already been mentioned by some of my predecessors, is on the fight against irregular migration, smuggling, and border control capacity building. So consequently, the new MFF enables a significant increase in allocation of the external dimension of the migration management and asylum and a comparably smaller increase when it comes to the internal dimension. Second, the fact that the budget for these policies is undergoing the highest increase in relative terms supports the argument that it is sometimes politically easier to negotiate a budgetary increase than to reach a political consensus on a legislative change as we are currently experiencing with the Migration Pact. And finally, the EU budget plays only a complementary role and is not intended to replace national budgets. So the general EU budget, including funds for migration and asylum, remains rather modest to cover the actual needs and if we wanted to do something more about it, that would require more radical reshaping of EU resources. And this feature might become even more visible in case the Migration Pact or all its legislative uh, elements get adopted, as I will show in a moment. So despite these difficulties of the new MFF, I would go in the direction to suggest that we are now moving in the right direction by increasing the budget for migration and asylum. And I'm now moving to the second part of my, my talk, where I will address the impact of the Migration Pact 
on migration, asylum, and border control budget. So the implementation of the pact, in particular screening, relocations, returns, and most importantly, border procedures, will generate considerable financial costs due to all the administrative, operational, and human resource requirements they will impose on a number of member states. And the new tasks will mostly fall on those member states which are either the frontline member states or where actually most relocations take place. So as regards relocations, the proposal for regulation on asylum and migration management foresees considerable funding by proposing an amendment to the Asylum Migration and Integration Fund, AMIF, which would enable financial support to the member states of relocation covered from the AMIF thematic facility. Article 72 of the proposed regulation on migration management stipulates that member states will receive 10,000 Euro, uh, euros contribution for each relocation, whereas the contribution is increased to 12,000 Euro, uh, euros for unaccompanied minors. Now, the question is whether this is sufficient. So the lump sums of 10 and 12,000 euros are considerable. Now, this does not necessarily mean that they will create a sufficient incentive for member states to actually opt for more relocations. The experience we have had from the two relocation decisions from 2015 is not promising. After the expiry of the two-year implementation period of the relocation decisions, as we all know, the results were disappointing, as only a bit more than one-third of planned relocations actually took place. Obviously, neither the financial incentive nor the fact that the non-compliance with the prescribed relocation quotas amounted to uh, the fact that, that this would actually amount to the violation of EU law amounted to the fact that the member states were actually willing to relocate. The lump sums offered by the current proposal for migration management regulation are more generous than the ones prescribed by the relocation decisions. But this no, does not necessarily need to make a change. Except for relocations, all the legislative proposals contained within the Migration Pact envisage that the Asylum Migration and Integration Fund and the Border Management and Visa Instrument will contain sufficient funds to cover the costs by the, uh, of the stipulated activities. So no additional financial or human resources are required based on the wording of the legislative proposals. However, it is questionable to what degree the new MFF can actually cover the costs of the new task, tasks envisaged by the Migration Pact for two reasons. First, financial implications of the pact could neither have been taken into consideration in the Commission's proposal of the new MFF, which was drafted much before the Migration Pact, nor were they considered in the member states' negotiations of the new MFF. It remains to be seen whether the resources contained in the thematic facility, which is the flexible part of the funds, will suffice to cover the member states' needs, as they cannot count on extra resources from the non-flexible parts of the funds. And second, the usual co-financing rate for the AMIF and the BMVI is 75% of the total eligible expenditure of the activity, meaning that member states have to cover the rest of the costs. So consequently, it is difficult to predict what share of the costs of the new activities resulting from the Migration Pact member states will have to cover from the national budgets 
and whether they will have sufficient resources for these costs. Most importantly, in case of uh, insufficient investment in the new infrastructure, human resources, and procedures, the migration pact might create the opposite effect from the desired one. As certain member states might end up with more delays and with more violations of EU law, including asylum seekers' rights. Um, it is questionable, again, how the Commission will react to such violations, whether it's, it's maybe going to try to compensate for the deficiencies of the procedures envisaged by the Migration Pact by being reluctant to start infringement proceedings, which, as we, as we have just heard, are very political in their nature. So finally, considering the unpredictable financial impacts of the pact, it is not surprising that the current, at the current negotiating stage, member states, particularly the frontline ones, are insisting on laying down the specifics of the screening, border, and return procedures that will define who does what and who pays for every single step of the procedures. So the financial component of the Migration Pact surely plays a major role in the negotiations and in the possible implementation of the Migration Pact. Thank you very much. Thanks to you, uh, Iris, for this very well-structured presentation. Again, I mean, uh, putting on the spotlight one of a series of the key questions that should, should have been, will have to be addressed uh, if we want to make any progress towards achieving the aim of the pact. I repeat what I said earlier. Now, we have our first uh, panelist who is going to be connected with us uh, online and not present in the room. Uh, so, Professor uh, Meldam Seeger, um, I, I hope that I'm pronouncing your name correctly. You are uh, jo joining us from uh, the Suleiman Univers Demiral University in Turkey. Welcome uh, to this conference, uh, and the floor is yours immediately, please. Thank you, Jean-Louis. I hope you can hear me well. Loud and uh, clear. Yes. So, dear colleagues, good morning. My name is Malta Minili Giyar, and I'm an assistant professor at the Süleyman Demirel University Faculty of Law in Turkey. Uh, I have a presentation. Uh, it's good to see it. I would like to start by thanking organizers of the conference, including Philippe and his team and Jean-Louis, for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today on the envisaged change in the new pact on migration and asylum from temporary to immediate protection. Next slide, please. So the European Commission concluded in 2020 that the EU is still lacking a toolbox to address situations of crisis and that the Temporary Protection Directive of 2001 no longer responds to member states' current realities. The regulation proposal addressing situations of crisis and force majeure in the field of migration and asylum presented as part of the new pact seeks to repeal the directive and introduce immediate protection instead. Today, I would like to focus on these two, uh, these two protection statuses, discuss uh, the differences between them, and whether the new view proposed immediate protection status is more likely, be, uh, more likely to be implemented in practice and provide a union-wide approach to managing massive fluctuations. Next slide, please. For the temporary protection directive to be implemented, triggered, or activated, the Council, upon the proposal of a Commission, should adopt a decision by a qualified majority and determine that a mass influx situation exists. Mass influx is defined quite flexibly in the Temporary Protection Directive as arrival in the community of a large number of displaced persons who come from a specific country or geographical area. As this definition shows, there are no objective indicators that determine which instances can actually qualify as a mass influx situation. And this was one of the reasons cited why the directive has remained obsolete to date, because it has not been activated so far. In the new proposal, the Commission maintains the need for an activation or trigger mechanism for immediate protection status to be triggered. Um, yeah. Um, so the immediate protection uh, status to be triggered, the Commission should adopt an implementing act triggering the granting of immediate protection status 
and examination procedure applies. So member states still have a say, but the commission will be the ultimate decision maker in terms of triggering the immediate protection status. The proposal introduces a number of indicators to facilitate identification of a crisis situation. To begin with, an imminent or actual mass influx should exist. Secondly, the mass influx should consist of third country nationals or stateless persons arriving irregularly in a member state or disembarked after a following uh, search and rescue operation at sea. This means persons evacuated to the member states from countries of origin or neighboring countries hosting large no a large number of refugees cannot be eligible for the immediate protection status. And this is a stark difference between the personal scope of temporary protection and immediate protection. So let us imagine the situation in Afghanistan. If in the future, the temporary protection directive is activated and evacuated Afghanis from Afghanistan or countries like Pakistan are designated as, as temporary protection beneficiaries, they can receive the temporary protection status and can be protected as, in a time limited manner in the European Union. But if the proposal is accepted as is, they will not be eligible for the immediate protection status because evacuation programs are not included to the scope of immediate protection. So for a crisis situation, the third indicator designated by the Commission as for a situation crisis to exist, the number of persons arriving irregularly should be disproportionate to the population and GDP of the member state concerned. And this is a welcome addition and a clear indicator which can help actually the policy makers determining the existing of a mass influx situation. Finally, the proposal notes that the nature and scale of the arrivals should make the member state asylum reception or return system non-functional. Although the overwhelmed asylum and reception capacity of a state is accepted in the literature as a general indicator of a large scale influx situation, I do not think that readmission or removal capacity of a state should play a role in determining whether a crisis situation exists or not. So in the blog post, I, I argued that this indicator perhaps should be deleted uh, if and when the final text is adopted. Although it is true that the proposed regulation increases the number of indicators for determining a mass influx, or as newly put by the Commission, a crisis situation, some of the proposed indicators are still vague and need further clarification and reconsideration. Next slide, please. When you compare temporary protection and immediate protection statuses, the novelty of immediate protection is the fact that the Commission, instead of the Council, will have the authority to decide when immediate protection will be granted, who will receive it, and for how long. Immediate protection is to be provided to displaced persons who, in their country of origin, are facing an exceptionally high risk of being subjected to indiscriminate violence in a situation of armed conflict and who are unable to return to that country. Now, when you read this, I'm sure you find it quite familiar because this actually means immediate protection is to be granted to a group of persons who, if international protection procedures would not have been suspended, would be eligible for subsidiary protection on the basis of Article 15C of the Qualification Directive. Therefore, when we compare these two statuses, temporary protection can be granted to a broader category of displaced persons. The Council has the power to decide who will receive the temporary protection status, though when you examine the temporary protection directive, refugees, persons forcibly displaced due to violence, systematic human rights violations, endemic violence, those who are evacuated from the countries of origin or first countries of asylum, if there are evacuation or humanitarian evacuation programs, can be granted temporary protection. So compared to temporary protection, the new blue proposed immediate protection status have been the personal scope of immediate protection have been defined quite narrowly. And in my opinion, this limits the potential use of immediate protection uh, quite a lot. Next slide, please. When we look at the other particulars of the newly proposed immediate protection framework, we see that the rights of protected persons are quite different. A person holding immediate protection status would be eligible for the rights of subsidiary protection beneficiaries as laid down now in the qualification directive, but the, proposal, uh, but the proposal makes a reference to the qualification regulation proposal. However, immediate protection status holders will have no right to family unification. Compared to temporary protection directive, which only foresees basic minimum treatment, because let me remind you that this was one of the first asylum instruments adopted following the Kosovo crisis in the first phase of the CS, 
and therefore uh, temporary protection status holders would only receive a somehow basic minimum treatment consisting of protection from reform on, uh, a time limited resident permit, a limited right to work, a right to education and social assistance if there are no means. So um, compared to temporary protection directive, uh, status, immediate protection status holders will definitely receive more rights and entitlements. When we look at access to international protection procedures, we see that both procedure, uh, both statuses do not prejudice the rights of its beneficiaries to apply for international protection, although processing of asylum applications can be postponed until temporary or immediate protection ends. When we look at the durations, uh, this is also different. Both immediate and temporary, um, sorry, the duration of temporary protection is one year and can be further extended by the council up to three years, whereas immediate protection can only go on for up to one year. The commission can decide, for instance, immediate protection can go, um, go on for a few months, six months, or any time up to one year. Next slide, please. So in light of this comparison, uh, I would like to conclude with, with, the con uh, with the following conclusions. Immediate protection with its narrow scope shifts the focus from providing effective protection to large number of displaced persons in mass and flux situations to giving breathing space to member states until their asylum and reception systems work again. However, I'm sure if you have uh, read about temporary protection directive, you will realize that one crucial always remains. If the proposed regulation on crisis and force majeure is adopted, will immediate protection status be used in practice? So will it be triggered? Will it make a, uh, will it make a real difference in the ground? One of the reasons for the non-implementation of the temporary protection directive to date was the belief shared by many member states that activation of the directive may create a pull factor towards the European Union. Immediate protections narrowed down personal scope might address this concern to a certain extent, though only time will tell whether this would be enough to address the pull factor concern raised by member states. Another reason for non-activation of the directive so far was the qualified majority requirement in the Council to activate the directive. As Raul mentioned in the last session, since large arrival of refugees or displaced persons is likely to affect only a few member states. For instance, when the arrivals are coming by sea, it would be probably Italy, Malta and Greece. It is very difficult to persuade other member states to activate um, protection regime to, to manage mass and flux situations. By removing the qualified majority requirement, one may think that the Commission is more likely to implement or trigger immediate protection framework compared to temporary protection. But when you look closely in the last 20 years, you will realize that the Commission in the past two decades has never formally prepared a proposal to activate the temporary protection directive in light of this, I would like to conclude that similar to temporary protection, immediate protection is likely to remain as a measure of last resort to respond to future mass influx situations in the EU. And coming back to the panel's main question, more EU as the solution, considering that immediate protection status will be unlikely to be implemented in the future, it is doubtful whether there will be more EU in managing uh, mass and flux situations and granting temporary protection across the Union. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you very much, Meldam. Again, I mean, a presentation which we all appreciate because it's really to the point. I mean, it's first of all within the time limit, which was assessed to you, but I mean, you immediately raised the key question and you end up with, I would say, again, one fundamental interrogation about uh, the possibility to actually implement an instrument which was seen by many, by the way, as a possible improvement coming from uh, the, uh, or provided by, by the new pact. Now, let me turn to the last panelist of this morning. I mean, who is, happens to be the convener of this conference, uh, l'architect de cette conference. Philippe, uh, thanks a lot for having had the courage, as I said earlier, uh, to approach the still very hot uh, issue of uh, Afghanistan crisis or not to be seen, and to illustrate to that last presentation whether there is indeed possibility for and for a useful uh, more involvement of the EU in trying to find solution to crisis situation. Philippe, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. What I will try to do is uh, to look at uh, the case of Afghanistan in order to understand if 
the pact would be implemented, the legislation uh, adopted, would uh, the uh, situation in terms of management of migration flows uh, uh, change. And of course, uh, the first element to, to look at is the statement made by the Justice and Home Affairs Council on 31st of August that is quite contradictory because they insist a little bit on the, on the need to protect uh, uh, per asylum seekers uh, from uh, uh, Afghanistan, but actually the emphasis is put on uh, the management of migration flows, and they speak about uncontrolled, large-scale illegal migration uh, movement faced in uh, the uh, past that they don't want to see anymore. This is, of course, a reference to the 2015-16 uh, uh, crisis. And they uh, even insist once more about the idea to prevent unauthorized entries, which is, of course, quite contradictory uh, with the arrival uh, of uh, uh, asylum seekers. So that's actually the, the, the context uh, in which, following which the, the EU institution are uh, approaching the current situation of Afghanistan. Now, I will look to uh, six points in order to understand uh, on which points they would or not be uh, a change. As has already been said, the first point is about externalization, and externalization is actually the solution uh, used by the European Union to uh, uh, manage uh, uh, migration uh, flows. And when you look to the uh, GHA Council statement, they insist uh, a lot about the, the idea to, to provide support to third countries, in particular neighboring uh, uh, countries, in order uh, to help them to welcome and, if possible, uh, to keep uh, migrants and asylum seekers uh, on uh, their uh, territory. So I would say that on that point, there would be no change with uh, the uh, new uh, pact. There is nevertheless uh, one uh, element that can be interesting uh, when it is about the idea to apply the definition of safe third countries to Pakistan or, uh, for instance, uh, 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 Iran. Uh, in the current um, Asylum Procedures uh, uh, Directive, there is a problem because there is a clear reference in the definition of safe third, country, safe third countries to the Geneva uh, uh, Convention. Uh, the uh, protection uh, in this safe third country must be provided in accordance with the Geneva Convention. So what does this mean is not entirely clear, but when you look in the, to the 2016 asylum proposal, uh, asylum procedures directive uh, proposal, this time uh, you see uh, that the reference is to countries uh, applying substantive standards of the uh, Geneva uh, Convention, which is not the same, so it's quite clear that safe third countries would not anymore to have ratified the uh, Geneva uh, Convention, but to evaluate to which extent uh, they apply substantive standards is uh, not very clear in practice, and even the definition is uh, also not very clear. What does that mean, the substantive standards of the uh, Geneva Convention? So if we think of applying the, uh, what we can call the, the Turkish model uh, uh, to uh, safe third countries like Iran uh, on, of Afghanistan, it would be uh, uh, easier, but there may still be uh, difficulties that uh, could lead to uh, a preliminary question uh, sent to the court of uh, Luxembourg. Now, about externalization, there is, of course, the element of resettlement. And uh, in the statement, there is a reference uh, to resettlement when it is said that support could be provided in the form of resettlement on a voluntary uh, basis. So actually that's nothing new. Re resettlement remains uh, voluntary, but it's quite interesting to, note to notice how careful this statement is drafted because it's not about uh, efforts that, in terms of resettlement that should be provided, but that could uh, be uh, uh, provided uh, in liaison with the situation in uh, Afghanistan. So this is extremely uh, 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 careful. We may have an answer 
Um, regarding the question of resettlement, are, is there going to be an increase of uh, places for resettlement? Because uh, in the next days, the resettlement forum is going to be uh, convened and the commission is probably there going to push in favor of more resettlement places for uh, Afghanistan. Second point, um, immediate, temporary protection and uh, immediate uh, protection. Well, I can go quickly because uh, Meltem has already uh, explained that uh, actually if immediate protection uh, was uh, applicable, it would not apply uh, to the situ current situation in Afghanistan, simply because there is, for the moment, not any more uh, harm conflict uh, in uh, Afghanistan. So it would be impossible to uh, activate uh, immediate uh, uh, protection and, uh, uh, of course, this is a step, uh, I think, backwards in the wrong uh, direction compared on that point to the temporary protection uh, uh, directive. It would even not be legally possible to apply uh, immediate uh, uh, protection. I'm going to pass very quickly about the situation at the borders. Of course, there, there would be an important change because there would be a possibility and even an obligation to apply border procedures uh, to asylum cases and uh, also uh, to uh, return uh, uh, cases. To which extent will that be uh, a change will be uh, discussed uh, in another panel, so I don't, of course, have the time to enter uh, into these uh, considerations. Fourth point, determination of the responsible uh, uh, member state. Well, uh, very easy to say that there would be no uh, change. Countries of first uh, asylum would remain responsible on the basis of the main criteria uh, of the country of uh, first uh, uh, entry. And this uh, generates, of course, all the problems that we will also discuss regarding uh, solidarity. Now, in terms of qualification, definition of persons that can be protected, there we would have a change more or less uh, 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 limited. So uh, what about uh, recognition rates and the divergences between uh, the uh, member states? So if subsidiary protection was applicable, but for the moment it would uh, not be applicable regarding uh, the uh, absence of an armed conflict, but it could be applicable, of course, on the basis uh, of Article 15b uh, of the uh, current qualification directive when it is about uh, preventing um, uh, refoulement to countries where uh, there is a risk of uh, inhuman or uh, degrading uh, 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 treatment. Regarding the armed conflict and uh, the uh, evaluation of the situation of temporary protection, we have a new element provided by uh, the court in a recent uh, ruling uh, of 10th of June in CF uh, NDN, where the court said that uh, the criteria, the, a simple criterion like the ratio between casualties and uh, the, uh, popul the size of the population of uh, a third country cannot uh, be used and that there needs to be an individual uh, uh, evaluation uh, of uh, the uh, uh, situation. So that will not help a lot because the key question is to evaluate the level of uh, indiscriminate uh, uh, violence. Now, an interesting issue, some uh, uh, states for the moment already think of freezing uh, applications introduced by uh, persons coming from uh, Afghanistan so that they would not be uh, examined for a certain period uh, of time. Would this uh, uh, change? Well, to my knowledge, we don't have uh, very explicit rules about the idea of freezing uh, asylum applications. We only have in the 2016 Commission uh, uh, proposal on asylum procedures directive the possibility to prolong the uh, examination period of three more months compared to the six uh, months foreseen for the duration of the uh, procedure. So it's possible then to go up to uh, nine uh, uh, months, but that's not a clear reference to freezing the examination process. It's more a reference to the time that uh, it is possible to take to uh, examine the uh, asylum uh, applications. This means that I have uh, almost uh, to uh, conclude 
and I will uh, do uh, so. Lillian has already mentioned um, what uh, could happen with uh, EASO, more guidance provided by EASO, and indeed the agency would be would have the possibility to produce guidance notes on the situation in third countries based on third country of, uh, of COI, country of origin uh, information, that should be taken into account uh, by uh, member states. So there is a possibility of more steering by the agency, but it will, of course, depend about the level uh, of indications given in the guidance notes to be adopted by uh, the uh, uh, board. Now about uh, return, um, I think on that side of the policy there would be very uh, little uh, change because the implementation of return policies is of course a competence of member states within the legal framework uh, of uh, uh, EU law and I think that there is still a risk of divergent uh, policies uh, between member states when it is about can you or not suspend or is it mandatory or not to suspend uh, return uh, procedure and it's quite striking to remember that on 5th August, 10 days before the fall of the Afghan government, several ministers were asking the Commission uh, to uh, still think uh, over the possibility to return uh, people to uh, Afghanistan. So in terms of predictability uh, of a policy, that's not a very uh, good sign. Of course, one more new element would be the creation of a position of return coordinator. But will that coordinator uh, be uh, in charge of defining uh, a policy like suspending uh, or not uh, returns? That's not very clear, but I think that that coordinator will be more involved in the practical implementation of a return procedure. And this is why I don't think that there would be uh, a change, but it's not excluded if uh, this coordinator uh, now becomes a person having a strong uh, position. So to conclude, uh, well, actually, you understand that there would be uh, a very limited uh, change in terms of managing uh, the uh, flows coming from uh, Afghanistan if the uh, pact uh, was uh, implemented. But nevertheless, just to conclude, there is a new element. The fact that apparently more and more member states are ready not to implement any more international law and EU law uh, on uh, the uh, asylum uh, acquis and actually uh, to uh, do refoulement at uh, their uh, border, if not directly to a country of uh, origin, at least uh, to uh, a safe uh, country. And that uh, would be, of, that, that's a, a new element. Uh, think of the situation of Greece nowadays. Uh, in case of uh, arrivals uh, of migrants as a more or less massive influx, would the position of Greece not simply uh, be to say we close uh, our uh, border to prevent those people to enter the uh, European Union? That's, I think, uh, a new element, not legal, but a factual uh, uh, element. It would not mean that nothing could be done, because think now of the situation at the border between Belarus and Poland about the migrants stranded, including some Afghans, uh, between uh, the two uh, borders. The court of Strasbourg has been asked to uh, uh, rule about a suspension, uh, so about, uh, sorry, um, temporary uh, uh, measures uh, based on Article uh, 39 of the procedural rules before the court, and the court said, yes, there is a need uh, to provide access to uh, uh, shelter and uh, food uh, for uh, those uh, migrants. So there is a legal tool uh, to do uh, something uh, in such uh, a situation, but of course it is quite limited. It remains to be seen, and this we will discuss later on, of course, if uh, the Commission could then start infringement uh, procedure or if the monitoring mechanism and the new one foreseen by the pact uh, would uh, uh, then be uh, effective. Thank you. Well, 
Thanks a lot to you, Philippe, for this very comprehensive and impressive uh, ways of testing the solution proposed by the new pact in, in real terms. I would say confronted with a situation which is unfolding uh, after the fall of Kabul and the taking over of uh, Pakistan by the Taliban. Uh, we have now a good 15 minutes, quarter of an hour, to take uh, questions from the audience. Uh, I would follow the, your, uh, the, the, your uh, good example, Philippe, and start asking whether we have questions from the virtual uh, audience. Yes, we have two questions. Uh, the first one is a general question for uh, Professor De Bruyker um, about the potential added value and role of uh, complementary pathways, including uh, humanitarian corridors in the, cost, in the context of, uh, of the Afghan crisis. And um, a second question for uh, Professor Thurdi uh, about, uh, um, the question is, when uh, you, Professor, spoke about a more steering function of uh, Frontex in relation with the implementation of the European Integrated Border Management within the Member States, it, it seems that somehow the agency role and within the, mem the member states that adopt their own national strategies. And the question is, what about the implementation of those national strategies? Is it enough to rely entirely on member states for their implementation? There might be uh, not, not, not be enough expertise in some of the member states, uh, or not enough determination in other member states. So uh, the final question is, do you, do you consider that the agency, the agency should be allowed or even tasked to get involved more into the implementation of these uh, national strategies? Thank you very much. Let's take these two questions, maybe starting with you, Lilian, please. Yes, thank you, Jean-Louis. Uh, so on this question, uh, this is where the two functions, uh, the, the steering function that I mentioned and uh, the, the monitoring or monitoring-like uh, function uh, come together. So it was asked what happens then in practice, uh, what about uh, the implementation? Well, this is something uh, where the agency contributes uh, through the so-called uh, vulnerability uh, assessment. Uh, it is not, uh, as it is uh, circumscribed, it is not uh, about uh, the policy, so it is not the aim, it's, it's more, uh, if you want, carefully worded uh, around uh, capacities, uh, and readiness to uh, respond uh, to emergencies, et cetera, et cetera. But through this uh, door, through this exercise, uh, there is the possibility uh, to, in fact, uh, through examining the kind of, of health uh, of the national uh, system, to look into the uh, implementation of, uh, of these strategies. Now, uh, a further uh, role uh, or involvement uh, in, uh, in monitoring, so more than this, as I told you, there is this gradation of measures. So then we have other uh, institutions uh, being involved. So first the, the own management board of the agencies, and then as I told you, as the ultima uh, ratio, this implementing act uh, of the council. So it is not up to the agency itself or alone uh, to be uh, more uh, intensely, let's say, involved uh, further in, in monitoring in terms of uh, the enforcement measures. So it was a, a delicate balance in the way that the mechanism uh, rolls out that involves uh, at, at the end uh, also the, the council before we reach uh, the level of uh, mandating deployments, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you, Lilian. Up to you, Philippe. So about uh, humanitarian, humanitarian corridors, uh, it's quite interesting to notice because it's something that we had not seen since a long time, that uh, kind of humanitarian corridors have been uh, implemented to uh, evacuate uh, not only EU citizens, but a person at risk of persecution because they worked uh, with uh, uh, EU uh, member states or, uh, for instance, also uh, the uh, United uh, uh, States. 
Uh, it's interesting to notice that there is a reference to evacuation in uh, the temporary protection directive that can be uh, uh, implemented in order to organize uh, evacuations of persons, but only if there is uh, a, a massive uh, uh, influx. And uh, you can uh, doubt uh, for the moment that, uh, well, it's, it's even quite sure that uh, there is no... Um, a massive influx for the moment from uh, uh, Afghanistan. Of course, it is possible to continue, now that the Americans uh, are uh, gone, uh, uh, to implement uh, evacuations through, through humanitarian corridors and, for instance, humanitarian visas. But I doubt that the willingness uh, politically is uh, there because our, the main concerns of member states it's, uh, is to avoid uh, Afghan asylum seekers to arrive in the European Union. So if we want to avoid that, uh, I think it's uh, not very likely uh, that significant humanitarian corridors will be opened by uh, 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 member states. We will have a discussion this afternoon to the extent, that's maybe a strange question, to the extent uh, to which uh, there is uh, an obligation uh, for uh, EU member states to um, uh, organize, uh, for instance, uh, uh, humanitarian corridors or resettlement from uh, some countries, and that will be a contribution that will be made by Paula uh, Garcia Andrade uh, this uh, afternoon, and I'm quite convinced that this will uh, generate a, a lot of uh, uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you, Philippe. Uh, I will now turn to the room, uh, but to, that does not prevent people in the virtual audience to keep on asking questions. I mean, we still have time afterwards. Okay, very good. So I've seen uh, Catherine, you had asked for the floor. Gentleman there, uh, I, I don't see your name, unfortunately. That would be the second. Uh, okay, thank you, Ms. Anson. And then yourself. And um, um, <laughs> Sophie, sorry. Uh, so four questions, uh, starting with you again, please. Um, thank you very much. Uh, in terms of the impact on Afghanistan, sh should uh, uh, had the pact been in place, let's say, um, I wonder about this question of protection rates, and we'll be interested in hearing your views, Philippe. Um, the given the the increased number of cases that would be heard, would ha have been heard or would be heard in the border procedure. Um, we would expect a reduction in the percentage of cases that are awarded protection. And if we look at the statistics going back six years, there's really actually surprising number of Afghan cases where protection is awarded at second instance, including refugee status, thousands and thousands a year. So um, that seems to be an issue. The other question would be, does the increased responsibility at the border point increase the likelihood of pushbacks? Um, and I'll just squeeze in a, a quick point on EASO, if I may, because I think I probably wasn't clear in my comments, and I'd be interested in hearing your views, Lillian. Um, in terms of whether EASO is enhancing protection or not, our, our view is generally yes, and my reference to operations was this new... Um, facility, this new team within EASO, which is called, I think, Horizontal Operations and External Operations, or something like this, which has just been created and links to Johansson's suggestion that EASO should be building the capacity of asylum systems outside Europe, as though there were nothing to do within Europe. Um, our research on operations within Europe shows actually generally that they've had a positive impact and something like the deployment in Lithuania we strongly support um, at least we did until the legislative framework changed and now we have deployment of EASO operations in sites that are not uh, that have been extra territorialized um, so I, I think the, the question is what do we recommend in that context more EASO Probably best, but but depending what it is, um, I'll, I'll uh, le leave it there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Catherine. Professor, uh, and, and, sorry, Professor Hansen, please. Thank you very much. Uh, just a couple of words on the notion of freezing uh, uh, asylum examination. 
Uh, that is really interesting, uh, and b both for very technical legal reasons, but also for more, more, more far-reaching policy reasons, I would say. If we accept the notion, uh, I think we are on our, on our approaching a system of introducing a new kind of temporary protection, uh, uh, extra legi, or not, if not contra legem. Um, we have seen tendencies to in that direction in a country I know well but don't want to talk about uh, in, in the beginning of the Syrian refugee crisis. And I think that gives some cause for concern. Uh, I would say that it would be uh, in violation of both the current asylum procedures directive and also of the 2016 uh, procedure regulation uh, proposal, simply because uh, these instruments have laid down very detailed rules about the duration and maximum time limits for examination, and they have these rules have also taken into account situations uh, referred to as an uncertain situation in the country origin, which is expected to be contra to be to be temporary. Uh, these are calculated already, included in the in the time limits. So I don't see any legal basis for for for, for a, 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 a formalized suspension or freezing. Uh, that was possible, I think, under the CP directive, in one way at least. Uh, but I don't think it is possible under the current uh, or the proposed uh, procedures instruments. Uh, thank you very much on that question. I will certainly turn to uh, Meltem Siegel later on uh, because, I mean, clearly you are the most, uh, the, the mo the, the, your intervention was, was really uh, focusing on, on this difference between temporary and immediate protection. Uh, let me now turn to you, sir, please, for your question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my question is directly on um, the criteria behind uh, immediate protection. Um, I think it was Professor De Bruyker who said there, since there's no acute fighting in Afghanistan anymore, this uh, system cannot be used, uh, but I wonder how strict that criterion can be interpreted because you can say there is still fighting in Afghanistan if you count uh, Panjshir province, uh, and I wonder if this is enough to justify uh, a use or recourse to, to this immediate uh, protection system. Thank you very much. Sophie, please. Thank you, Jean-Louis. Um, in terms of the, the topic of this discussion, more EU as the solution, uh, it seems that there is an expansionist approach for the EU and its agencies in the external dimension uh, and perhaps a more limited one in the internal dimension. And uh, it's notable that the justice and home affairs conclusions that we have all been speaking about, which are indeed um, a very interesting document, um, to a certain extent aspects of, of that document read like a foreign affairs uh, council conclusions, such as the emphasis on the external dimension. Um, I think we see this replicated as well in terms of the approach towards the EU agencies. Um, and thank you to all of the speakers for their, for their presentations, and uh, in particular Lillian on, on EASA, which I, I thought was, was, was really interesting, looking at both EASA and Frontex um, and, and the difference of approach to those two agencies. Um, I think what we see in relation to the agencies, in particular um, EASA in the JHA conclusions, is an expansionist approach to the role of EASO externally, um, but we see with the discussions on the EUAA regulation a more limited one internally. Um, this seems like a, a relatively incoherent approach to the future of these agencies when it comes to more EU. Yes, externally, perhaps not so much internally. Um, and I wondered if Lillian had uh, any reflections on, on that approach and what it might mean for the future of, of the agencies and their development. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sophie. As the clock is ticking, I will take a last question from the audience, uh, Emilio, then pass the floor uh, to uh, Meltem, Lilian, and Philippe to answer questions that were mostly addressed to them until now. And for the rest, it will be for informal discussion during the lunch break. Emilio, please. Uh, just to continue on the last question, which has been posed on the agencies, uh, I want just to draw your attention on the fact that uh, so-called agencification since 2000 uh, has been uh, grown in an uncontrolled way, and the interinstitutional agreement is a very weak framework to uh, define which is the role of these tools. Political and administrative dimension should not be uh, inter uh, interchangeable. 
And this is exactly what has happened for uh, borders, migration, and asylum, where politicians have uh, created administrative tool not to uh, face political choices. Look on Frontex. Frontex should work now on an integrated border management strategy, which has not yet been submitted by the Commission. We, uh, Frontex is still working on an integrated border management technical strategy, which means that only administrative people has defined the content which should be uh, enforced by Frontex. This is an observation that I made to uh, Lillian. Thank you very much. So now let me turn to Meltem uh, concerning that there were a couple of questions related to your presentation. And then again, I will pass the floor to Lillian and end up with Philippe. Meltem, please. Hi. Um, hi again. Thank you very much for the questions. Um, I would like to perhaps uh, start with Jens point and um, I agree with Jens that under the current existing EU laws there is no legal basis for suspending asylum procedures without the existing of a crisis or a mass fluctuation but both temporary protection and immediate protection allow suspension of processing of international protection application but perhaps we need to also think about one more thing and that is the international law implications of suspending asylum procedures. I mean, it is debated whether in mass and flux situations, member, uh, sorry, state party to the 1951 convention can actually suspend uh, RSD and grant temporary protection. And in this case, there are authors arguing that because um, the survival of a nation might be at stake, because then the large scale influx, such as in Turkey, which hosts more than 4 million uh, refugees or asylum seekers, uh, there might be a case that suspending asylum procedures might be uh, reasonable under the conventions and it might not violate the refugee convention. But I cannot see a scenario how a couple of hundred um, asylum seekers or refugees coming from Afghanistan uh, will provide a valid uh, legal basis for suspending asylum procedures under international law, under the refugee convention. Although there are, of course, different uh, problems which may arise from the EU law, because I also agree with Jens that there is no legal basis under the APR. Um, this is one thing. And um, as a second point, I think this was a question asked to Philippe, but I would like to offer a very brief uh, point. Uh, in the case of Afghani asylum seekers and refugees, I do not believe there will be a mass influx such as the Syrian one in 2015 mainly because uh, Turkey opened its borders to Syrian refugees and asylum seekers, and it's remained open for a couple of years. Uh, when Turkey has millions of refugees, then the crisis happened. But in the case of Afghani asylum seekers and refugees, although Turkey uh, didn't stop Afghan asylum seekers and refugees at the borders in the first few weeks, now they are building a, a wall between uh, Iran and Turkish border. So I do not think the arrivals will increase that much because the Turkish public opinion is also against uh, getting more asylum seekers and refugees, mainly from Afghanistan. So I think this is a case in point that there will not be a crisis situation such as the 2015 refugee crisis. Uh, but if EU wants to utilize temper protection directive, then I think uh, the number of arrivals to the European Union should amount a large scale in fluctuation, only then they can uh, open the possibility of granting temporary protection to those who are coming irregularly to the EU, but also those who are evacuated from Afghanistan. But as um, Philip mentioned, uh, for immediate protection, this is impossible because it is very difficult to argue there is an ongoing armed conflict. The armed conflict is mostly over, and I think those who are fleeing from Afghanistan would qualify as a refugee, definitely, most of them. Uh, and they might get subsidy protection under Article 15B under the Qualification Directive. And this is how complex it is. Thank you. Well, thank you for this very comprehensive answer, including the last part, which is also re responding to the question asked about the situation in Afghanistan and the possibility to consider that there would indeed be a lasting, continuing armed conflict in, the, in that country. So let's turn to Lilian now, please. Thank you, and I would like to thank uh, all the speakers from the audience for excellent questions and observations. 
So uh, I agree uh, on, on the comments on priming externalization. Uh, I agree with both of you, and I believe that this is one uh, of the greatest problems uh, in uh, further enhancing administrative uh, integration. So as I mentioned, I do not find that it is either inherently positive or inherently negative in itself. It has turned uh, negative because of priming uh, externalization, and that not only in the external sphere, stricto sensu, but also in the actions internally. Uh, so these are a mixed bag uh, as well. So some of the actions of EASO, uh, such as uh, training and, and rolling out of a training curriculum, have had a positive impact, but its involvement in processing in Greece, because it primed externalization and the effective implementation of the EU-Turkey deal uh, in any cost uh, has been actually uh, negative. So its admissibility decisions uh, regarding whether Turkey was a safe third country for uh, specific asylum seekers were overwhelmingly, uh, let's say, um, negative. So they were saying these individuals were inadmissible and then they were overturned by national authorities. So it was the Greek asylum service that said no, we cannot return uh, this or that uh, category because, uh, or this or that nationality of applicants because they would not uh, find effective protection uh, in Turkey. So we see these trends actually uh, being uh, entrenched and this priming externalization is now also uh, more evident in uh, the policy directions and in the mandates. But what is concerning is that Although the role, uh, for example, of the asylum agency is not uh, spelt out uh, black and white in these new pact instruments, it will have a role. And it will be worse because it will be unregulated. So without uh, details in the screening regulation or in the uh, new uh, procedures regulation, it doesn't mean that there is no interest operationally, so it won't be there. It will continue to be there, and on top of everything, without regulating the procedural, uh, let's say, implications uh, of, of its involvement. So it will be uh, even worse. And as for Emilio, indeed, there is always this reticence uh, of uh, combining uh, policy issues uh, with uh, the involvement of agencies. There was this fiction uh, that they can uh, actually be a technical tool uh, not, uh, let's say, completely uh, unrelated to the policy politics uh, dimension. And that's why also their monitoring mandates are circumscribed to technical elements uh, in the end. But at some point, it, it is, uh, we, we can ask ourselves, is this in fact or not a fiction? And can we have this clinical uh, if you want division between the technical and, and the policy aspects. Thank you. Thank you, Lilian. Philippe? Well, I will be very brief because the, the, the clock is uh, uh, ticking uh, about uh, procedures at the borders. Well, we, I think uh, the answer will be provided this afternoon with the next panel, so I will not elaborate on, on that point. Just one single element, when it is about accelerated procedures, I think one interesting idea is not to accelerate uh, procedures leading uh, uh, probably uh, uh, eventually to a, a negative uh, decision, but why not to accelerate procedure when uh, there is a presumption that the claims are well-founded? Uh, and that would be, I think, the case of uh, Afghans if they manage to arrive uh, at uh, the external borders of the European Union. The question about uh, the situation uh, in the Panjshir Valley, well, uh, it seems, but I don't know that the conflict even in that region might uh, be uh, over. Let's imagine that it is not uh, over. Then I wonder if member states would not try to implement the internal protection alternative by saying that people from that region could go back to another region of uh, Afghanistan. But of course, that's a whole discussion about the definition of the internal protection uh, alternative. So these are my two points to answer the questions. One uh, third uh, very important point is if somebody uh, found my glasses, I am interested because I manage once more 
uh, to lose them somewhere in the room. And I see that my colleague Boldizar has already found a solution to that very important problem for me. Thank you. Well, definitely. <laughs> Uh, definitely, uh, Boldizar is the, the man of the, of, of the, the moment because he will chair the, the next panel this afternoon. Uh, so thanks a lot for the uh, four colleagues who have participated into this panel. I think that, Philippe, uh, we can say that we had a very good start uh, this morning uh, for this uh, one day and a half conference. Uh, certainly on substance, not necessarily on solutions, but uh, the problem, the point is not that much to find solution at that point this time, is to, as I said it earlier, in identify in a lucid and balanced way a series of questions uh, that really have to be uh, met and answered at uh, political uh, level. Uh, thanks to all of you for having attended virtually or physically this uh, first morning session. Time is now uh, come for a lunch break. Uh, we'll resume, as I said earlier, at 1.30 in this room with a panel chaired by Professor Naji about processing at the borders, effectiveness and rights in jeopardy. In the meanwhile, bon appétit. See you later. <laughs>